Today on Inside the Issues, Vespa Mamani on Revolution and Change in the Middle East, Part 2. Welcome to this week's episode of Inside the Issues. I'm David Welch, the CG Chair of Global Security at the Balsillie School of International Affairs and Professor of Political Science at the University of Waterloo. Every week we talk to a noted expert on some aspect of global governance. And this week, I'm very happy to welcome back to the studio, Abespa Momani, Associate okay. Professor of Political Science at the University of Waterloo and a Senior Fellow here at the Center for International Governance Innovation in Waterloo, Ontario. And Besma, you are our first repeat uh, interviewee on this series. Honor. Uh, because of the timely nature of uh, your area of expertise, which of course is Middle Eastern politics, mm -hmm. um, we had a very interesting conversation a few weeks ago now on events in the Middle East when uh, the Egyptian situation was essentially coming to a head. And uh, Egypt has moved off the headline, mm -hmm. and Libya is now occupying the front page. Yeah. So uh, I'd like to explore with you what has been happening since we last chatted and what's happening now, and if possible, we can venture some guesses as to what might happen next. Sounds good. Uh, but Libya, of course, is the dominant story uh, these days, and events have been um, fast-paced, uh, somewhat unpredictable, I suppose. Uh, and yet, it seems to be, on the face of it, almost an entirely different kind of situation from the situation we saw in Egypt. Uh, well, how do you account for the rather dramatic differences in what was happening on the ground and how the regimes responded in these two countries? Yeah, well, you're absolutely right. They're very different in the sense that uh, many of us are lamenting what happened in Tunisia and Egypt, which at the time seemed so difficult, but in retrospect was such an easy fall of a very long-standing, you know, two regimes. You know, in the case of Libya, we're having um, uh, Gaddafi, which is uh, a leader of, in, in power for 42 years, adamant at not leaving. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, the international community has intervened uh, as of late to try and, and return some level playing field for the rebels. Uh, but what we've seen to date is really what many are characterizing as a stalemate, uh, really a sort of a, we are at an impasse where both the rebels and the Gaddafi regime are not able to make any more advances. And so the situation today is a tenuous one because many are, are, are seeing sort of dire possible scenarios if this does not come to an end quickly. Most of the coverage refers to the rebels uh, without much in the way of further identification. Mm -hmm. Who exactly are these people and what unites them as against the regime? Well, we don't know. That's the truth of the matter. Uh, we know that the CIA has been involved in Libya on the ground. Uh, some uh, news reports have come out that there are about 24 agents on the ground trying to really gather that kind of intelligence to figure out who is on the rebels' side. We know that it's a hodgepodge of different individuals, and, and that's part of, if, if I be very blunt, part of their weakness is that they're very much uh, ununited in uh, anything other than the purpose of removing Gaddafi. But in terms of uh, who they are, they're untrained, uh, they're civilians. Um, there's everything from you know engineers, uh, professionals, to taxi drivers, to students, to you know unemployed. There really is a full gamut of the society. And again, they're united in one purpose, which is to remove the regime. And, and if I be, can be very um, you know, blunt about this, this is life or death for them, because many know at first hand the kind of repercussions um, that would, or the reprimands that will happen if Gaddafi wins. So it's either now or potentially they're going to face death in the future if Gaddafi wins and, and who will really uh, have retribution on them and their families. So it's quite, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, life or death for them. And as we know, Libya is a very tribal society. I assume it's safe to say that the rebels are not members of Gaddafi's tribe. Uh, no. Uh, I mean, the Gaddafi tribe that Gaddafi comes from is um, just one small tribe. Um, this is not tribal, and Libya really hasn't had that kind of tribal society that dominates the real political structure um, for at least 40, 50 years. So that's something that is a little bit of an outdated mode of understanding Libya. Um, there are, you know, many divisions like we would find throughout the Middle East, whether it's through class, uh, uh, there isn't as much of an ethnicity or religious, you know, divisions in the country, but there are class distinctions and there are, you know, regional distinctions just naturally by by way of, you know, different, you know, sub-subcultures would, would kind of uh, grow in different parts of the country. But it's not tribal per se. Um, I don't think that 
the people around uh, Qaddafi are opponents to him in many ways because they've really depended and, and gained from his regime. So Qaddafi tribe, which has really gained a lot from, from the time that Qaddafi's been under power, and several others that have been close to him are united in wanting to keep him. But the vast majority have been uh, pretty much abused under him uh, for so long and really have nothing to lose. Uh, in, in fact, much to gain in getting rid of him. Now, there were Libyan armed forces units stationed in the east in what is now rebel-controlled territory. As far as we can tell, they've more or less joined the rebels. Is that right? Yeah, and you know, the, the sort of um, parade of, of defections is really quite wide uh, and quite interesting. And this is uh, something that we saw from the very beginning, uh, many diplomatic uh, personnel outside of Libya defecting very quickly. Some of them are from uh, uh, families with trip in, in Tripoli, which took on an added risk because, again, the retribution is a real part of this. You know, if uh, an ambassador defects, he has to be or she has to be very confident that you know her family is out or his family is out of the country or away from Gaddafi's reach, and that means being outside um, of of uh, Tripoli and surrounding areas. So the, we d we have seen a you know. A, a real uh, spate of, of, of defections recently, um, some from the foreign ministry. We, we realize the ex-foreign minister has defected, um, uh, Musa Kusa, who has, has left to London uh, with the assistance of the British uh, CIA or intelligence service. So there is a parade of, of defections, and that seems to keep continuing. But uh, you know, those that are really around his inner circle, uh, outside of his tribal affiliations, they're going to have a hard time defecting unless they can secure the security of their family. Mm -hmm. Now, all of the standard playbooks for conflict management and negotiation, international politics, all more or less assume that you're going to be dealing with rational individuals, mm -hmm. that the way to get them to stop doing what you don't want them to be doing is to increase the costs or offer them benefits, something of that kind. Right. Gaddafi, we've always known as a colorful character mm -hmm. and a bit of a uh, an odd character, yes, but some of his recent communications are downright bizarre. Yeah. And so one wonders whether we're dealing here with somebody whose view of the world is so, so strange that you know rational mm -hmm. cost-benefit manipulation simply isn't possible. There may be a mental health issue there. Yeah. What do you do with somebody like that when the standard tools just don't necessarily seem to apply because he may well be crazy? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I think he, he, there's no doubt he is a very odd person. In fact, I've, I've listened to many of his speeches in Arabic, which um, if you hear them, they're absolutely absurd. Um, there's no train of thought. He, he needs help, for sure. Um, but I think more importantly, you know, the cost-benefit analysis is really useful for us to understand the situation in Libya. Uh, you know, as I mentioned, you know, clearly we have um, many of those in the eastern part of the country uh, that have very little to lose because the costs of surrendering are much too high. Um, but similarly, we have a problem here, and this is what adds to the stalemate here, is that on the, on the political side, uh, the cost-benefit analysis for many around uh, um, Gaddafi are becoming, you know, it's becoming really, really quite high, uh, particularly as the international community is putting a lot of pressure on Libya and talking about you know, things like um, uh, retribution for past crimes and, and so forth, human rights violations. And, and now you've sort of made them dig a hole to ensure that they don't leave power. So there's no, I feel like it'd be very, you know, uh, visual here, but there's no graceful exit for any of these leaders as we ratchet up the kind of rhetoric that says, you know, they're now madmen now, they are lunatics, they're murderers, they're so forth. We make it very difficult for them to find a way out. Um, you know, we don't find the kind of transition to power we saw in South Africa. We're not going to get that as we keep ratcheting up this kind of rhetoric. So, you know, it's really quite dangerous um, if the international community keeps making out these leaders as soon as, you know, we support the pro-democracy movements as now being ruthless dictators that, you know, should be brought to the International Criminal Court. This makes it difficult for them to surrender as well. Right. I'd like to pursue the question of the international response in a minute. Uh, we will be back with Best Mamani. You are watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Welcome back. Best Mamani, let's talk a bit more about the international response because uh, many people, I think, were surprised at uh, UN Resolution 1973 mm -hmm. authorizing, in effect, the, the first really serious action 
under the banner of the responsibility to protect doctrine. And the resolution authorized a military action in a very limited way, basically, to prevent Gaddafi's forces from inflicting wholesale civilian uh, casualties. Mm -hmm. Now, it did not authorize intervention in the Civil War, but as you said, we now have a situation of stalemate, and we also have a situation where at least Gaddafi and the senior people in his regime don't seem at the moment to see any viable option other than digging in and fighting it out yeah. and hoping they win. So I'm wondering if you think the international response here is actually, in the long run, um, jeopardizing yeah. civilian lives rather than protecting civilian lives. If we've really made possible a long-term stalemate, how are we actually helping anyone? You know, we're really in a predicament, right? Um, it's true we have reached a military stalemate, and by that, uh, one could just focus on the city of Brega, uh, an oil town, which has converted back and forth between uh, rebel hold and uh, Gaddafi's uh, regime holding it for six times so far, last time I counted, in the past, you know, four or five weeks. So we're at the point now where it's a cat and mouse game. You have the rebel forces moving forward. Um, you know, they claim the city, they fight it out, and they retreat. Gaddafi forces take the city, and they claim victory. And back and forth, we've been on the same town, um, stuck now for about four weeks, and like I said, six times turnover. So we really are in a political or a military stalemate. And that brings the question of either we pump up the military side, if we're in effect trying to have the rebels you know, win this out, we supply the rebels with arms, which is really quite dangerous, uh, primarily because these are a ragtag kind of military, you know, or a rebel group that are not trained. Uh, I don't know if we can really um, expect them to do well with armament, to be very frank. And that's, that's a problem. Um, we don't know who we're giving this to. And, and by that, I don't mean the ideological composition of this group. I mean, they don't have the training. They may harm themselves with the kind of weapons that we want to give them. So we've already seen lots of, you know, uh, self-inflicted fire, frankly. This is, not, this is not an organized rebel group. They haven't had the experience of being, you know, a rebel group for 10, 15 years that you would find in other countries where there is really a kind of insurgency happening. This is, again, put together very ad hocly in, in, in a matter of, of a couple of weeks. So that's the first thing. The second thing um, is, you know, who is going to authorize that, that kind of military um, uh, uh, transfer of weaponry to the rebels? We know that Qatar is providing uh, some armament uh, via uh, Egypt. Um, that's no longer uh, co you know, um, covert. Uh, it's been um, publicized by the uh, general of the, the rebels group. Um, so we see that, and I think that is probably the best case scenario to be, you know, to put this in the international political context. Um, the Western powers don't want to be seen you know, arming the rebels. Uh, they had a very difficult time resolution in 1973. Uh, we have now NATO taking over the command of this. And uh, in NATO, Turkey is a very reluctant uh, partner to authorize, uh, you know, expanding the purview of, of the UN Security Council resolution 1973. They want to keep this very much on a protecting the civilians only. So we're not going to get the kind of international consensus, I believe, to arm the rebels. Uh, and we're going to see more of this sort of, again, you know, um, uh, quiet diplomacy or quiet uh, channeling of arms uh, through the border, but we're not going to see that kind of wholesale international effort because there just isn't that consensus to arm the rebels, and that's really what we need to get this done militarily. Now, that doesn't mean it can't be done politically. That's a whole other question, but I don't think we're going to get that kind of resolution or that kind of consensus in the international community to move forward. Well, another option is sending in NATO troops, sending in ground units making it a NATO war. We've done that before. I don't think they would ever get the consensus needed. I mean, Turkey um, had a very difficult time agreeing to this um, at the United Nations. Um, Erdogan is very clear about wanting a political resolution to this, not wanting to um, uh, arm the rebels. Uh, he's made that very clear. Uh, recently, there was a, a Turkish ship that took uh, um, injured individuals from Misrata to Benghazi 
and Erdogan made it very clear after that that this was the way that each uh, sorry the way that Turkey viewed itself in the Middle East that it would be a, a diplomatic actor and it would not uh, let it being the sole Muslim power in NATO uh, authorize the use of war and the use of NATO troops on the ground. Again, part of this is there is such deep resentment in the region toward foreign troops there. I don't think we can forget that, that the past behavior or the past um, you know, action of Western powers uh, in, the, in the region, particularly in the case of Iraq, was just disastrous on a humanitarian scale. A million Iraqis are, are dead today as a result of the American uh, invasion and, and occupation there. So there's just no appetite. The Arab League would, I think, be very much critical of it. You know, the head of the Arab League is Amr Musa today, who was vying for presidency in Egypt. He has a very low-class, popular base. Uh, this would not sit very well with the idea of having foreign troops, NATO troops uh, positioned there. It would not go well whatsoever, even among, you know, Egyptians who are supportive of overthrowing Gaddafi very much on a popular level. But the concept of bringing foreign troops into the Middle East is absolutely not uh, expected or wanted by, by the powers. What about pulling the rug out from underneath Gaddafi? Is there a way to make his second and third tier lieutenants abandon him to make his soldiers lay down their arms. And I think that would be great. I mean, I think that's really part of the, you know, the sort of political squeeze that we can put on him. Um, you know, the defection of uh, Musa Kusa was excellent uh, in that, and that was really uh, negotiated by the British Intelligence Service. Now, this is, the, this is the quagmire we're in, right? I mean, Musa Kusa has blood on his hands, right? Including what many are pointing out to be the Lockerbie bombings, that he may have been implicated in some way of that. So we have to start to think about this in international community. We, if we're going to buy out, if you will, through some sort of arrangement to get these individuals to defect uh, and to put the squeeze on Gaddafi, uh, I'm afraid we're going to be promising things. Are we going to be promising them immunity uh, for many, uh, like the families of Lockerbie, or, or in the case of many of those uh, Libyan families who have been affected by uh, the terror of Gaddafi himself and his, you know, his, his cronies? They don't want that either. They want them to stand trial, and this right. is the quagmire we're in. Making pacts with lesser devils in order to get the bigger ones. Absolutely. We'll be right back in a moment with Fesma Momani. You're watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Welcome back. Now, Libya is not the only story, but it's the dominant one. Let's talk a bit about some of the other percolating stories that haven't been getting quite as much attention. Uh, in particular, uh, Syria seems to be possibly the next theater of uh, operations for revolution sweeping the area. What's your understanding of the state of affairs in Syria at the moment? Well, Syria is really um, quite interesting. You know, if we sort of thought this was uh, these revolution or the Arab awakening or the Arab Spring were easily explained by the level of autocracy of the regimes, uh, we're quite surprised that Syri Syria took this long because it really is one of these regimes that has been very autocratic for so long. Uh, but there are a couple of things um, happening in the country that we should be watching. Uh, one, we see that there are uh, rebellions in areas like Dara, areas like Latia, uh, which are towns that are not the core. They're not the large towns. They're not the large cities, I should say, like Damascus, like Aleppo, uh, where, in fact, um, that would be really the something that would really scare the, the regime itself. Um, concessions that Bashar Assad has recently announced to try and placate their demands have been laughable at best. Um, you know, he's arguing about removing the emergency law, the state of emergency laws, but yet making them now uh, very draconian anti-terror laws, which is really just replacing it with a different name. Um, in the case of both uh, Dara and Latkia, they're uh, very much um, regional, uh, very different, if you will, culturally and economically from Damascus and Aleppo, the two major cities. So there's long-standing, if you will, sort of feelings of isolation, um, not being favored by the central government, uh, not getting the kind of services that they require and so forth. 
Um, but what we're, we're going to see, I think, that will be very fascinating is when Damascus actually starts having the kind of protests um, calling for the end of the regime. And so far, we haven't seen that en masse, uh, partly because the security service there is quite strong. Um, they know that's their base, that's, that's the heavily populated areas. Um, in the case of Aleppo, which is a town that is historically very anti-government. Uh, surprisingly, we haven't seen anything, uh, partly because there's a lot of Secret Service uh, infiltrating uh, the city, making sure um, you know, that people aren't even thinking of protesting. So the real sort of um, prize, if you will, uh, in this, uh, if, if the revolt is really going to take some momentum and, and make a change on the ground, is if we see something happening in Damascus and Aleppo. And so far, those are calm. And what would we have to see, and how might we see that? Well, I mean, there are there have been Facebook, you know, campaigns to get people out. But what's really interesting is that the government has been able to come out to the street in force uh, in advance of the rebellion starting. Um, so that has, you know, stopped much of this. And more importantly, there's just a lot of fear. There's still, you know, uh, this is a really repressive regime that um, has a history of, you know, kidnapping people and, and taking their families and so forth. So people are not, um, people are not coming out uh, in, in fear of that. And the presence of the military on the street is quite strong. I mean, I've heard uh, friends of mine who recently um, spoke to family there and said that, you know, the government is making every individual coming out of a public building, you know, take a flag and a picture of, of Bashar Assad, or they will write their name down and put them on some sort of list, you know. So there's this, you know, this fear that's being, you know, embedded in the, in the people today that, you know, if they don't, uh, and then we saw en masse this one, the one protest that came out in Damascus was in favor of Bashar Assad. Well, according to, to friends and sources there, they were paid about equivalent of $12 an individual to go into the protest. And if you didn't go, well, your name was on this notorious list that no one knows what's going to happen to those who don't agree to go out. It's a fairly so, easy cost-benefit calculation. Very easy, yeah. absolutely. Now, if something dramatic does happen in Syria, of course, that would reverberate internationally, uh, probably more significantly than Libya would, right? Libya's international absolutely. footprint is the oil production, but mm -hmm. Syria, almost owns Lebanon, right? Lebanon's virtually a subsidiary of Syria. Mm -hmm. uh, there's Iranian influence, uh, unstable border with Iraq. Yeah. All kinds of things could happen. How, how does the international community approach Syria given that actually we have a stake in stability there, even yeah. if we don't like Assad's regime? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that we really, we really need to be careful with Syria. This is not uh, this is not Libya, this is not Yemen, it's not even Egypt. I mean, it, absolutely, the proxies around um, around Syria are quite dominant and, and could um, become a very widespread regional conflict, and we don't want that to happen. Um, so that, I think, is, is something that um, we all need to be cautious about. I do think, though, that, uh, you know, in the case of Syria, one of the things that um, we don't have a very good assessment of sort of how the inner circle works. And one of the things that is coming out or that many of those that are sort of on the in uh, have been saying is that really Bashar al-Assad as a president is actually really reformist in his thinking. He's actually quite progressive um, and could be an agent, uh, you know, a positive agent toward change. But it's those old guard around him. And one of the things that we need to be careful about is if we put pressure on Assad to leave, what many in the country also fear is that you, you remove Assad, you're actually taking the most progressive voice of the inner circle out. And what's remaining are the old guard that were around his father who were notoriously repressive and quite uh, a draconian in, in, in their uh, mindset and, and the way they kind of uh, deal with repre or uh, opposition. But so perhaps they're dominant already? I mean, Bashar has not managed to do much that's a, in the way of progressive. Well, I mean, economically, it's opened up quite a bit. Uh, politically, we haven't seen a lot of changes, absolutely. And many had hoped that through the economic liberalization, we would see the kind of political liberalization. And that hasn't come, to, you know, that hasn't borne any fruit yet. But I think there is some room for international pressure to be put on him and his regime to reform, to liberalize. And I think that the the people of Syria can do that effectively uh, by continuously asking for more 
political space. Um, and I think that that eventually may be a negotiated way out. But we, what I don't think we want to do, at least as international community or as Western powers, is to think about any military intervention there because that would just widen the conflict immensely. And if you reform and liberalize a repressive Ba'athist regime, don't you in effect sign the death sentence of that regime? Absolutely. I mean, the Ba'athism that is supposed to, you know, be the base of his ideology has almost disappeared. Uh, you know, this is, you know, it's still, there's still a strong state socialist component of the regime. Um, but as liberalization, as foreign investment has trickled in, and we've seen a lot of foreign investment come into Egypt, uh, sorry, into Syria, uh, they're getting all meddled into each other, um, into Syria in the past, um, you know, five or six years, we've seen a lot of that kind of state socialist policies break down. And that's really quite healthy. And then we've seen a new birth of entrepreneurship in Syria, uh, particularly with diaspora Syrians who are bringing in investment back into the country, uh, building uh, factories, building um, a lot of um, um, uh, infrastructure and industry and services to really make the country grow. Uh, and all this has helped put pressure uh, politically because many of these entrepreneurs who are coming from outside the country are not on the in, if you will, and are starting to ask for you know, removal of red tape, removal of the kind of cronyism, all those favoritism that were given to many of the inside uh, economic elite. So we're seeing some changes on that front, but it is slow. And I think more importantly, the hunger and appetite of the Arab street in many of the Middle East countries is to have rapid change. Right. And so this just isn't enough. Um, case where slow case. change may be better than rapid change. In the case of Syria, absolutely. Right. We'll be back again with Vespa Mabani. You're watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Welcome back. Uh, let's talk briefly, Vespa, about some of the other countries that are still of interest. Uh, Bahrain, Egypt, Saudi Arabia potentially, yeah. Yemen. These are all interestingly different, but still potentially uh, troublesome yeah, countries. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, in the case of Bahrain, um, I don't know how many have watched this because it really has been under the radar in many ways, but the Saudis uh, brought their military in and basically clamped down and cleared out uh, Pearl uh, Roundabout or Pearl Square and got rid of all the protesters. Seven people were killed in the process. Uh, and now the square is empty, uh, the roundabout is empty, there aren't protesters there, but now the opposition has retreated and is still very much calling for um, for reform, for constitutional uh, monarchy, and so forth. And this is another country where proxies are, are important because, in fact, uh, we've seen Iran, which has had some uh, religious affiliation to the Shiite uh, Bahrainis that live there, uh, calling for um, uh, the, the right of Bahrainis to, to demonstrate uh, freely, which is quite ironic considering what happened in Iran a few years ago. Nevertheless, um, in reaction to that, uh, the GCC, the Gulf Cooperation Council, which uh, you know is a military, political, and economic uh, union of six Gulf countries, uh, and Saudi Arabia is actually the hegemon of that, has actually you know responded with a statement recently, about two three days ago, uh, calling on Iran to basically mind its business and to get out of affairs in the region. And this was probably the strongest kind of anti-Iranian rhetoric coming out of the GCC that we've ever seen. So it, it is really quite interesting um, that we're seeing, you know, the, uh, the Saudis taking the lead here and telling Iran, this is not your, your, your zone, this is not your sphere of influence, stay out and don't get into the, you know, the internal business of our countries. Mm -hmm. Yemen, of course, is on the other side of Saudi Arabia, and we haven't seen so much overt activity on the part of Saudi Arabia there. Mm -hmm. um, is it just so isolated that it's of less concern to the region as a whole? Well, uh, it, it is a little bit um, more isolated in some respects, although there is Saudi influence there uh, and Saudi interests, uh, particularly when we look at um, the fact that Yemen is a populous country with a lot of laborers, and so there is a li labor migration issue. In fact, much of the Gulf countries, um, they get a lot of their, their manual labor from, from uh, Yemen, so it's a, it's a, it's a key uh, part of their economy. 
Um, that said, uh, Yemen is um, interesting because um, Ali Saleh, who is the president there, is obviously one that has been on the side of, call it the, the war on terror or on the American side to really try and clamp out Al-Qaeda. And as we know, uh, Saudi Arabia has also has its own Al-Qaeda franchise, that it's a problem in the country as well. So this is not a regime that they want you know, brought down so quickly because of that. So the, the Gulf countries are quite concerned about there being similarly some sort of negotiated solution there so that they don't have the kind of you know, recklessness or lawlessness um, happening in the country. Uh, Qatar has recently tried to broker a deal with um, with Ali Saleh as well, and he's refuted it. Um, and Saudi Arabia recently spoke to Ali Saleh, inviting him to Saudi Arabia to actually come and talk about potential ways of, of a mediated solution. Because again, for much of the region, they don't want this to be a hotbed for Al Qaeda. They don't want the country to fall into anarchy and become Somalia, which is uh, very much a possibility with all the kinds of cross-cutting you know, cleavages happening in the country. Qatar is playing an interesting role. It's, Absolutely. it's seizing a leadership initiative when it's actually a very small country. What accounts for that? You know, it, it, it's been punching above its weight for the past five, six years. Um, you know, what accounts for that is really the very uh, visionary view of the, the leader there and his wife. In fact, his wife, uh, you know, Sheikh Muzza, is actually one of these, you know, fascinating women of the Middle East who has a very progressive but yet traditional view, ironically, of the region. And, you know, through their you know, the Qatar Foundation, whether it's through Al Jazeera, whether it's through the Doha debates via, you know, uh, uh, BBC, uh, all, you know, bringing in Georgetown campus there, bringing in all of these sort of um, uh, cultural and educational centers into the, into the country to bring about a kind of, you know, new Middle East um, through progressive intellectual thinking. So it's a, it's a fascinating country. They have definitely been trying to be uh, a strong diplomatic actor. Uh, we know that in the case of Libya, they have uh, sent several of their planes to go under French command. Um, they, again, they've been trying to broker something with Yemen. Um, they're sending arms via uh, Egypt into Libya. So they're very much active on the diplomatic front. Fascinating. Indeed. Mm -hmm. Last question just about Egypt. Okay. So we don't want to forget about Egypt entirely. Are you more or less pleased with how the post-revolutionary order is shaping up at the moment? It's still early days, of course, but are you on balance hopeful or do you you know, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful, and I think that there is a lot of popular frustration in the country. Uh, it's, a, it's a very difficult uh, transition. Uh, the military, I believe, is trying as best as it can to bring some normalcy to the country under the circumstances. But there is a young, you know, revolutionary movement that wants rapid change, particularly on, this, on the state emergency law front. And I think that under the circumstances, they're doing well. Uh, we'll see elections in September, the parliamentary elections. Uh, we'll see in a year's time a presidential election. And the future of Egypt is very bright. But in the short term, many people are very frustrated and wanting things to move faster than, than is happening, unfortunately. Still very fluid times, isn't it? Absolutely. Well, thanks again for joining us. Uh, appreciate it. And I'm sure we will have you back as the situation unfolds. To all our viewers, I actually want to offer one mea culpa. In episode 12, when I spoke with Tom Burns, I uh, meant to say that the euro had been in circulation for nine years, and for some reason I said 19. Uh, but it's only been nine. Anyway, I hope you will join us again next week for the next edition of Inside the Issues, a CG online podcast. Meanwhile, you can find our complete set of uh, episodes online at cgonline.org, on Facebook, Twitter, or on YouTube.